the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, do me a, a favor here. Take your fingers out. Let's, let's do this. Check. See if you have a pulse. Okay. So it seems like your heart is beating. Just feel under there. Do you feel any breath coming out? Okay. If you're breathing, you're praising. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Wow. Everything that has breath gives praise to the Lord. Um, I wanted to just... Uh, it's kind of, I was thinking back and I was remembering um, years ago. Uh, it was actually when, when Zach was getting ready to be born. And uh, Stephanie, I don't know how she did it, but she talked me into going to Lamaze class <laughs> with her. And uh, boy, now that's fun. Hey, fellas, let me tell you, now that's something you've got to do at least once in your life. Get in a room with eight ladies that are eight months pregnant. <laughs> And they're ready to have that baby. And they're telling you how to breathe and how to coach. And, but one thing I remember about it, I remember the instructor told us all something that's really important during the delivery is to just stay calm and focus. And she taught us how to take a cleansing breath. I've used that all my life. A cleansing breath is just when you take in a good breath and, it, and it, it's just like you have a gate right here that you just... You let it open up and you just pretend it's going all the way to your feet. And you... And it feels so good. And it's relaxing. And here's something I wanted to just tell you. I've studied this verse a little bit. And there's a particular nuance to it that almost seems to say that one translation could be when you're breathing, you're praising. Now, now think about what this is telling us. That it's so powerful that God says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, I want you to, I want you to just do it. Do it with me. Just let's take a big old cleansing breath. <gasps> praise the Lord. Praise the you, Lord. If, you're, if you're breathing, you're praising. Yes. Yes. God has designed us to be people who... To praise Him with every breath. I, I'm going to um, transition to a, a real teaching about um, something that I think is so important. And, and let me just say this. If you find yourself continually getting nervous and on edge and um, just perplexed and bewildered throughout just any week, just stop and just say out loud, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Amen. And just in with the good air, out with the bad. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So the sermon this morning is entitled, Getting the Emotions on Board. I remember a couple of years ago when someone started talking about emotives and emojis, and I had to ask, like this teenager, what did you just say? What? What's an emoji? And now they're just so much part of text life that it's just, did you know that there are actually um, cash registers that now use pictures instead of numbers, similar to, to the emojis, so that um, it's really changing our, our world. Let the emotions get on board. Um, what do you mean getting the emotions on board? How, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I'm talking about. God designed us as emotional creatures. He made us that way. You cannot stop being emotional. Me, for instance, I've got a face that is a dead giveaway. My wife tells me, I know what you're thinking. The moment the moment I say it, and I can see it all over your face. And I have often said, I have a face that has a mind of its own. It's, it does things that I'm not even aware that it does. And that's just part of emotions. And, and did you know God designed us as emotional people? And so he wants us to experience emotions. I'm one that believes life has joy and sadness, but I would sure have, I'd rather have much more joy than sadness. 
I'm one who believes that we can be happy the majority of the time. Now, I'm, I don't mean when I say let's get the emotions on board that you walk around looking giddy with a stupid Christian grin all the time. It's fake. People will see right through you. But by the same time, by the same token, you don't have to walk around looking like you've been baptized in lemon juice. It's okay to be happy and be a Christian. And to let those emotions be brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There is a psalm, Psalm 100. It teaches us about bringing those emotions on board. And we're going to move through it together. I would like to ask you to stand to your feet in honor of the reading of the word. Read these five verses with me. Here we go. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May God add rich blessings to the reading of His Word. High five your neighbor, and then you can be seated. God bless you. Psalm 100 is a powerful teaching. I'll bet you there's not one person in this room who hasn't at some point in your life heard verse 4 as a song. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I want to show it to you in Young's literal translation for just a moment. And, what, and by the way, Young's literal is from late 1800s. What it attempts to do is give you an exact word-for-word -word wooden translation to try best possible for you to see the original word order. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not good, because with languages you kind of have to you know, bring it into a, a new dynamic, and so you might reword it uh, differently. But notice how it's worded. Enter ye his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Um, give ye thanks to him. Bless ye his holy name. Now, of course, that's archaic language. We don't speak in these and those and ye's anymore. But you bring that into a modern equivalent, and here's what it is saying. You enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You come into his courts with praise. You bless his name. There's an emphasis on your involvement. You go, church. You worship, church. It's your responsibility. And there is a very real sense in which it's an act of your will. It is volitional. Now sometimes you feel it, and sometimes you don't. But I would say, especially when you don't feel it, you need to discipline yourself even more to come into God's presence. Amen. And maybe the proper way, an even better way to say it is, I will to enter into His gates. Yes, amen. I will to come into His courts. I will to bless His holy name. It is an act of your will. You choose to do it. Yes, so, if you want to see the emotions come on board, that is, if you, you really want to feel it, then you discipline yourself to follow the teaching of Scripture, and the emotions will come in, in line. Amen. The emotions will come on board. I remember hearing Press Gillen years ago teach about how the emotions work. And uh, he says, you know, you're walking down the street and, and all of a sudden 
Boom, right there in front of you on the sidewalk is a snake. The emotions go whoosh. And the mind says, oh, that's just a rubber snake. Darren was pulling a joke on me again. But the, the, the mind figures it out, but the emotions stay stuck on floor nine for about 30 minutes and slowly come back down. And it works in every arena of life. Listen to me, men. The mind, or the eyes says, curvy girl. <sighs> the mind says, I have the most beautiful wife in the world. I will honor my Lord and I will honor my, life, my wife. Amen. And you, as an act of your will, you choose to enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Amen. To come into His courts with praise. And here's what I found. Uh, you know, Paul describes this spirit slash flesh living. Living by God's Spirit in a body, in this earth suit, a container that is, um, is designed to... Uh, it, it, it's corrupted, it, it's sinful, and, and it has this nature that's carnal. But my heart wants to honor God. Yes. And so... What I do is I choose that I will honor, honor the Lord. And then the emotions, they're stuck on the ninth floor, but they come down. Mm -hmm. And the more you train your emotions, the more you train your nature, guess what? You're not in charge. I live by the Spirit of God. I walk in the Spirit of God. Then the more you do that, just notice the more victory you have. Amen. And just begin to notice how the emotions come on board. So I'm going to give you five simple instructions this morning. And if you follow these, these are going to help us to bring those emotions on board. And here's the first one. Dwell on truth. Dwell on truth. <laughs> By implication, the obvious statement is, don't fall for a bag of lies. Think about what's true. And, and so, by the way, so many people in current culture will fall for anything, but we're going to focus on truth, and we're going to follow the truth of the Lord. So listen to what the psalm says, verse 51, verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Let them rejoice. I like the way that this verse is worded in the Amplified Version. By the way, um, Joanne Boss loved the Amplified Bible. And um, just yesterday, Stephanie found another picture of Joanne, and we sat there and looked at it on her phone and thought, oh, I miss Joanne. Uh, God called a wonderful saint home on New Year's Day this year. Uh, but she loved the Amplified Bible. Look how it says it there. Help me hear joy and gladness, not gloom and doom. I'm going to listen to truth. Amen. I'm going to hear the truth. And when I position myself to receive truth, then that's when God's, God's work uh, happens deep in our, our emotions, deep in our intellect. His Spirit takes over. So notice this from Philippians chapter 4. And you may have thought this many times, but this is just such a powerful scripture because it gives us a prescription for God's peace. Well, see, this is just like Dr. Jesus said, okay, take two of Philippians 4 and call me in the morning. <laughs> and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ yes. Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters... Watch this. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, it says, if it, whatever is ad admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And whatever you've learned or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So you're thinking about true things, pure things, noble things, upright things. 
Uh, how many of you could be just like the Apostle Paul? Now be honest, would you be able to say just like Paul did, if you see anything in my life, go ahead and put it into practice. There's another place where he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to say that? Wow, what an amazing thing. So throughout this next week, these seven days, just have your antenna up to the Holy Spirit. And if there's times where he says, now really, come on, Keith, is that true? Is that honorable? Is it praiseworthy? Is that excellent? I mean, really, let's be honest here. Is that something you should be thinking, doing, participating in? Let's be open to the Holy Spirit because as we dwell on truth, then we start to see God doing His work in our hearts and our lives. Now here's the second one. Worship as a lifestyle. Some of us are guilty of thinking worship. Oh, that's that part of the church service when the songs are happening. That's worship. Well, that, yes, of course that's worship. And we refer to that as, hey, the team's coming, we're just going to worship. It's focused worship. But actually, if you want to think about the entire church service, the whole thing is worship. From the very beginning, I mean, from the moment you walk in and you shake somebody's hand at the front door, you've already started worshiping. You're fellowshipping together. You, and then we sing songs, we read scripture, we pray for folks. We, um, all of that is worship. When we open the Word of God and we learn from His Holy Bible, it, we put teaching into practice in our lives, that's worship. But don't stop there. Worship is not just Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Amen. Worship is all week long, 24-7, yes, just living in the presence of our Lord God and just serving Him. Yes. Worship as a lifestyle. Um, I, I love this quote from C.S. Lewis, and, and he's speaking about worship. And he says, worship is inner health made audible. Amen. So think about that. When we are worshiping, what we're actually doing is celebrating how God's healing has happened on the inside. Yes. God, you touched me. I have inner health. And so because of that, I'm just worshiping you. I grew up in a family where uh, worship was 24-7. I mean, really, literally, it was just, Stephanie can tell you, the Howard Bunch growing up, it was, it was unique, wasn't it, sweetie? I mean, it's different and, um, than most people I know. For instance, my mom, uh, she would, I remember countless times, her singing, in the spirit while doing the dishes. I remember my daddy out under the hood of the old Chevy Impala trying to change the alternator and it wouldn't, that bolt would not break loose no matter what he tried. And he just stopped and I remember he's just leaning there over the, the hood and I heard him say, now Lord Jesus, I just got to get this alternator off here and get it changed out. Now I'm just asking you, give me the strength. Amen. Let Jesus, yes. Lord, just Amen. let this thing come off of here and let this car yes. run. And he took the same wrench he'd been using and all of a sudden, whoop, it just yes. came right off. And Dad said, thank Amen. you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And went on and changed Amen. the alternator out. I mean, it's fired Amen. right up. That, that's the way I was raised. Yeah. And I wonder if Jesus came by our homes like if he walked in the front door, what would it be like? Would we, would we say, uh, wait out there on the porch just a second, Jesus. I just need to tidy up a little bit. Turn that TV off. What are you doing watching that? Get those magazines put away. You know, what would it be like? It should be the case that the Lord Jesus could be welcomed into our lives any moment of the day. Worship as a lifestyle. Um, here's, here's the third one, and this doesn't sound spiritual, but it really is. Learn to laugh at yourself. Don't be so serious. Amen. I, uh, I love a quote that I, I read by uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And he said, we wouldn't worry quite so much what everybody thought about us if we knew how little they actually do. <laughs> Learn to laugh 
at yourself. Um, the scripture says this, and it's Ecclesiastes 7, 16. Do not be, what a weird word, over-righteous. What? Do not be over-righteous. Neither, neither be over-wise. What are you talking about, Solomon? You mean you can be too righteous? You mean you can be too wise? What? Obviously, that's, you know, that's not what he's saying. What he's, he's getting at is, why destroy yourself by trying to be this super persona that is all things to all people at all time, God's answer man, God's man of power for the hour, always on duty, always on call, never let your guard down, always keep a stiff upper lip. And I'll tell you, if you try to be that, you will be the most exhausted Christian that is anywhere on this on the planet on the face of this planet. I'm trying to learn to laugh at myself, and I was as I was thinking about this message this week. I thought, well, do I laugh at myself? And sometimes I do. And I thought that's worth sharing with them. <laughs> it was beginning to be winter time, and the Lord had blessed us. We lived in Colorado. It's exact opposite in Colorado than Arizona. Arizona, you, play, you pay high bills for electricity during the summertime because you want to have air conditioning. In Colorado, you pay high bills for heat during the wintertime because you want to be warm. And um, the Lord had blessed us. We had moved into this new home, and it was just starting to get cold. And, and Stephanie mentioned it. Ooh, it sure is chilly in here. And I'm like, you know, we, we need to go ahead and fire up the heat. And I go in, and we've got this brand new furnace and the whole thing. I mean, it looked just brand spanking new. And, and um, you know, I'm setting the thermostat. I'm doing all kinds of work. And, and we're waiting a couple hours. Does it feel like it's warming up at all? No, actually, it's getting colder. And then before you know it, the sun starts to go down. And, and yeah, it was starting to get really cold. Man, I mean, I'm in there. I've got the bottom tray pulled off. I'm trying to see is there some, you know, what, what did they call that? You used to have to light the... Uh, the pilot, yeah, the pilot light. I don't think it even has a pilot light. I can't <laughs> find it. I'm, man, I'm getting nervous, and I'm shining the light in there, and, and um, nothing's working. Uh, well, now, I, I would not wish this on Pete or Larry or Shelly upstairs, but in this situation, we had a board member that lived next door. Now, I know you've got, you're going to have nightmares tonight thinking about that. That's not something I'm suggesting. But... I, I said, I better call Steve. Steve was, um, you know, he was a, a, a contractor and he did all kinds of things. And I said, Steve, it's getting cold. I, I'm trying to get this thing going. I think when they installed it, they did something wrong. I, I can't. And so he says, I'll be right there, Pastor. He comes over. And I remember the, the, um, he had his flashlight because we were going to dig down under there and figure out what was wrong. He comes in and shines his light in. It took him one second and he just started snickering. <laughs> he said, now pastor, now you see that switch right over there that says off and on. <laughs> if you will just put that in the on position, this thing will fire right up. Oh man, boy, did I feel smart in that moment. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you another one. One time, this is in the days, this was in the days of call forwarding. Cell phones were just coming out. Nowadays, a lot of people don't even have a landline, but in those days, you had a cell phone and you had a landline, and you had this new invention called call forwarding. If somebody called your house, and if you weren't there, it could forward to your cell phone, and you could pick up the call. And man, everybody that was really trendy and hip, boy, they did that. You could reach me any time of day, which is, I, I'm not sure that's a good thing, but anyway, that's the way life works. So I had left out of the house, and I'm, I'm driving down to the church office, and uh, somehow, I, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I pick up things uh, inadvertently. I'll grab something, I, I'll just get my keys, my phone, and, and so I had already been out to the car and then went back in, and as I'm leaving, I grab my cell phone and keys and, and to the building, and I, you know, I get out in the car, and I'm driving down the road, and, um, and then I look down in the seat, 
And I had grabbed Stephanie's cell phone and mine. Somehow, I ended up with both cell phones in the car. And so, <laughs> I thought, I better call her and tell her, baby, I'm sorry, I've got, I've got your phone with me here in the car. <clears throat> so I, I use her phone so she will see on the caller ID um, that, that it's me calling on her phone. And so I called the house and she's in the shower and the, the message machine clicked in for call forwarding and it sends the call to my cell phone. So now picture this. I'm driving down the road. I've got my cell phone and I'm waiting for Stephanie to pick up. And my phone starts ringing. Now, I used to deliver newspapers while I drive. I'm ambidextrous and some people say amphibious too. And I, I pick up the... I picked up my, my cell phone, I'm like, I got this, I can just put her on hold, and I can talk to this, whoever this is calling, and, and I, I say, hello, and, and at the same time I hear, hello, <laughs> I said, yeah, hello, this is Pastor Keith, hello, this is Pastor Keith, <laughs> I called myself, and I'm, not only call myself, but I was carrying on conversation with myself. I think that's the definition of psychosis or something. I'm not sure. But hey, learn to laugh at yourself. Um, don't, don't be so serious all the time. Life, life is hilarious. Life is a hoot. And God created you with emotions. And you might think, well, what in the world does that have to do with anything spiritual? Here's what it has to do with something spiritual. When you come in the door, if you're carrying all the luggage and all the baggage from life, and you come into church and you have to sit there for the first three songs and be primed into worship until finally you start shaking it off and then you start getting into God's presence. Listen, you can bring the presence of God Amen. with you in the Amen. door. Glory. You can do that. You can live in His presence. And so, here's number four. Good people around you. You've got to surround yourself with good people. Get good people all around you. Um, here's a verse from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15.33 um, says, Do not be let, misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Young people... Hear the sage old Pastor Keith. Bad company will drag you down. Bad people will corrupt you and lead yes, you come astray. On down. Come on. Surround yourself with good people. Amen. I've said it before, but if you want to soar with the with the eagles, stop hanging out with the turkeys. Amen. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I remember, I'm just remembering this when I was in high school basketball. Every day we had to run sprints. And at first I was so flattered because the coach would say, okay, partner up. I want to run with Howard. And then I, it took me a little while to figure out what was going on. They wanted to run with me because I was so slow. <laughs> that way, when they run their sprints, they can take it easy. Because Howard's so slow, it'll look like I'm trying, but I don't have to try too hard. When I figured that out, I was really deflated. It, when you are running the race of life, surround yourself with people that are going to stretch you. Don't, don't be surrounded by people yeah. that are mediocre and have no life ambition and they're just sucking the life out of every room they go into. Get people around you Amen. that have vision and hope Amen. and dream for the future. And surround yourself with good people. Look at this, Philippians. Um, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. The, the fifth thing I wanted to share with you is deal with disappointment. Deal with disappointment. If you deal with the disappointment... Then it's going to do something to your emotions on the inside and release you so that, so that you can be a vibrant, life-giving uh, force for Jesus Christ. Now here's the verse. It's Philippians chapter 4 again. We were there earlier. But on down in the, the 
in the chapter. Here's how it reads. Like that, Paul's saying, I'm just like you. I know what it is to have need, and I know what it's like to have plenty. And truthfully, all of us, the ebb and flow of life, sometimes you have need, sometimes you have plenty. I, you know, somebody said one time, money can't buy happiness, but I sure would like to try. Wouldn't you? <laughs> but the, the truth is, sometimes you're going to be having plenty, sometimes you're going to be in need. But he tells us something really important. He says, I have learned the yes. secret of being content in Amen. any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this yes. through him who gives Amen. me strength. Yes. Yes. Amen. Our Lord will enable us. Amen. He will strengthen us. And so, he's, he's calling us away to this special relationship in which he helps us. He deals with the disappointment. The year was 1920. There was a young young man, his name was Oswald Smith. He was a wonderful Christian young man. He wanted to be a missionary. There was nothing he wanted more than to be a missionary. All through his teenage years, he had prayed, he dreamed, he desired that he would be a missionary. And on this particular day, he was standing before the examination board to become a missionary. And he just thought, I will go through with flying colors. They're going to love me. They're going to give the approval. And in a short while, I'm going to be serving God as a missionary. That day, though, he was dealt a severe blow. They rejected him. He did not meet the qualifications. He did not pass the criteria. And it, it sent his world in a tailspin. Young Oswald Smith was hurt. He, he deeply in his heart, he had dreamt of being a missionary all of his life. But now he found out he was not going to be able to be a missionary. So he has a choice to make. What do I do? He began to pray about it. And the Spirit told him, you know what? You may not be able to go as a missionary. But perhaps you could pastor a church that sends missionaries. And so that's what he decided to do. He became the pastor of a church in Toronto, the People's Church. He was there for many years. That church sent more missionaries to the mission field than any church in the era of his pastoring. And it happened because he changed his focus he could have been so disappointed. It could have plummeted him down. He could have said, well, fooey on you. I thought I was going to be a missionary. I offered myself and you rejected me. So I'm just going to sit over here in the corner and eat dirt and grub worms. <laughs> but he says, I may not be able to go myself. Amen. But I can train other people to go. Yeah. Amen. And we'll be the greatest church that sent missionaries all around this globe. And still, he is one of the greatest figures in missiology today. Because his heart was to do whatever it was the Lord wanted him to do. He took that disappointment and he turned it around. And you can do the same thing with your disappointment. Did you know in 1858, there was a series of debates between the Senate hopefuls, Stephen Douglas, and a young man named Abraham Lincoln. And they had seven different debates. The debates centered primarily on slavery. It was a very controversial topic. And when the votes came in, even though Abraham Lincoln won the popular vote, Stephen Russell's strategy was to try to win the legislature because they were the ones that voted and sent people to the Senate in those days. And sure enough, in a very unusual occurrence, they decided to send Stephen Russell as the senator from Illinois. And Abe Lincoln was disappointed. Now, he could have curled up and died. He could have said, I'm a loser. I'll never amount to anything. He had had multiple setbacks. 
Little did he know, three years later, he would be elected the President of the United States and be the one to lead our nation in changing and uh, abolishing slavery. Probably the greatest thing that's happened in the history of our nation. Amen. See, you have disappointments. Sure you do. We all do. I've had my share. I know what it feels like to feel like you've been sucker punched and it doubles you over and you think I didn't see that coming. I got blindsided. But if you will give your disappointments Amen. over to the Lord, He will Amen. take them. And he will lift you up to a higher plane. All of these things will help bring your emotions on board. Basically, this is what I hope you take away from this message this morning. Here's the takeaway. Don't let your disappointments drag you down. Rise above. I want you right now to speak to that area of your heart where you've had some disappointment. I want you to call it to mind. Don't let your disappointments drag you down. Rise above. Heads bowed. Eyes are closed. Worship team is coming and they're going to lead us in some praise. I want to ask you, have you taken care of the greatest disappointment of all? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you have not, I want to just tell you, you can be the greatest in your field. You can be the smartest person in your area of expertise. You can work harder than anybody else. You can start early in the morning and go till late at night. But the psalm says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord is the one who builds the city, all of its inhabitants are wasting their time. You will be sorely disappointed until you give your heart to Jesus. And then you'll be amazed at how the emotions just start to come on board. I want to ask if you're here today and, and if you are precisely that individual that I was just talking about, you have not asked Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. I, I, would, be, I would be letting you down. I would not be doing my job as a minister of the gospel if I didn't give you the opportunity to receive Him as your Savior. I want to give you that chance right now. And it's not hard. It doesn't have to be hard. It's easy to get saved. It's easy. Now that doesn't mean it's always easy to be a Christian. Sometimes it's very hard. But the concept of becoming a follower of Christ is so easy. All it is, you just simply need to say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on that cross for, for my sins. I believe that you rose again, and I accept you. I profess my faith in you. I confess my sins to you. And according to that faith, and according to your holy word, I believe I am saved. That's, that's all. You can do that right there where you're sitting. It's, it's not magic words. You don't have to say the exact words I said. That's not a scripted prayer. That's just me talking to the Lord from my heart. You say it right now. You can say that in your heart. You do business with Him and ask Him to be your Lord and your Savior. I want to know who the ones are who ask Jesus in your heart today because I promise to be praying for you right out the chute. We want to get you off to a good start and you need prayer support. You need people around you. You have my word that I'm not going to single you out and make you come down to the front. I'm going to be a man of my word. I will honor that. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I would like to see who you are. If you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, perhaps it's for the very first time or Maybe it's been a long time and you realize I have drifted. I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. And I need to make a fresh start with Jesus. If that's you, 
I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up and make eye contact with me so I can see that that's why you're lifting your hand. Who are the ones? I'm asking Jesus to be my Savior, Pastor. I hope and pray this means that everybody in this room is already saved. But if, if you haven't yet, and if for whatever reason you say, well, I'm just not ready to do that, you keep coming. You keep reading the Word. You keep praying because I believe that you're going to have a real breakthrough very soon. Yes. While this team is leading us in prayer, I'm going to be down here in the front and I just want to be available if any of you would like prayer for anything at all. So I think I said it the wrong way sometimes to get my words twisted around. They're going to be leading us in a song. And I'm going to be praying for anybody that would like to have prayer down at the front. And if there's more than one, if there's ten people, we have a team of people. They've counted an honor to pray with you. So if you want prayer for anything at all, just come down to the front. And very quickly, someone will meet with you to pray. Team, would you lead us and let's worship?